All right. Hi. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, like we had said that, you know, Des is not here today. He is um, vacationing. And uh, so you're stuck with me and Robert today. So you'll have to put up with me. Uh, anyways, uh, if you will take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And while you're getting there, uh, I'm just going to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come to it and to gain some understanding of you and, and uh, Lord, that it would work in us and have its effect. Thank you for all that you have given us in this age of grace. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. All right, if you are at, uh, at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and you can, take a, you can take like one of your markers or something like that and just kind of hold it there while we flip to a couple of other verses and all that. But um, I, I've chosen, I wanted to go over this verse here a couple of weeks ago. I was going over this verse in a um, thought of the week. And a, a couple of months ago, this, this goes back to a couple of months ago, or maybe even almost a year ago. If you, if you remember, I was uh, telling you of my, um, my friend that he had gotten colon cancer and he had struggled with it for several years. And he eventually succumbed to it. He passed from it. Uh, but as he was getting closer to his time of departure, if you want to call it that, um, we would go and visit him. And he was, you know, we, we talked scriptural things, and one thing that he said as he was actually lying on his deathbed um, was he turned to me and he said, Todd, I wished I'd have chased after righteous things. You know? instead of just doing whatever he wanted in life. And the thing is, you know, I believe, that, um, I believe that he was a saved man. He trusted in the Lord. He just didn't give it a whole lot of thought after that. You know, he, he basically did um, not considering the things of the Lord. And, and when he got to the end of his life, he had regret uh, for not following after those things. And fortunately... For him, the Lord gives forgiveness to those who trust in him, right? I mean, he, he, we are fortunate that we have a Lord that loves us and, and gave himself for us. And he gave himself for us even if we don't give our lives to him, right? Even when we are irresponsible or even when we don't do the things that we should do, God is good and forgives us. And has taken care of us. And I'm thankful for that. Because I think we all, in some level, fit that category of not devoting our lives to the things of God. But anyways, if you will come to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And just to get a little of the context, we're going to start in verse 3. <laughs> but the main part of the verse is going to be verse 6 through the bottom there. And... In verse 3, the Apostle Paul is writing here and he says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, surmisings, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. And that, I mean, that is something that, uh, that's part of the verse that I want to look at right there. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And as I sit here and talk to you guys about this, the main reason why I have to teach on this is because I need to teach that to myself. You know, to learn to be content, you know, where I'm at. And, and not only 
not only the thing about contentment, but to understand godliness with contentment. So, so that leads us to, the, to that word godliness. What is, what is godliness then? What does it mean to be godly? And uh, if you'll take uh, and look across the page at 1 Timothy chapter 4, to me it's just on the other side of, on the other side of my Bible, but you might have to turn a page back. And um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 3 over there. I call it God's diet and exercise plan, if you want to think of it that way, and you'll see why. There's a diet, he has a diet and exercise plan. So, um, in verse 6, the Apostle Paul starts, he says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine wherein thou hast attained. So the first thing he says there is that if you'll put these things in remembrance, you'll be a minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up. So what do we think of when we think about being nourished? You know, typically we think of, of nourishment, we think of eating, right? We're going we're gonna to nourish our bodies. Uh, but the, the Word of God uses this word nourished here in a way that, that we take in the Word of God and we, we come to the Bible and we read the words and we take it in. And, and it, it, it acts like nourishment to us. You know, it's not your physical body, but it's your spiritual body that it's nourishing. So, uh, in Jeremiah, you don't go there, I'll just read this to you. In Jeremiah 15, 16, he says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. So that's kind of like what Paul is saying here. We take, we take and ingest the word of God. But then he goes on to verse 7, he says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now what does it mean to exercise? To, be, to exercise, it means you're going to put something into practice. So first we see that you're, you're nourished, you're, you take in the Word of God, and then the next thing you do is that you start exercising with it. And, and we think of exercising as you know, getting some weights out and starting to, to build our muscles, but exercising means to use it. You know? So when you come to the Word of God and you start exercising it, it means you start allowing it to work in you. And you start, you start practicing the things that you're, re that you're reading. He says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. I always like that verse, if you think about it. He's talking about exercising godliness. Now, all that really means is that you're focusing on the things of God. Not, not in a religious sense, you know, like, you know, like religion in the world does, but the things of God, we find them written on the page, written in, in the Word here. And so when, when we come to put importance on godly things, it means coming to the Word and reading it being nourished by it, and then we start exercising by allowing it to have its effect on us. It, it, you know, it, it works in us that way. So that's a little bit about godliness, but what does it mean to be content? And, you know, in, like I said in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. And the Apostle Paul was one of those guys that gives us an example of what that contentment can look like. Uh, and if you'll go to Philippians chapter 4, remember to keep a marker in Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But if you'll come to uh, Philippians chapter 4, and we'll see a little bit about what contentment looks like. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse, we'll start in verse 10. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10, uh, 
starts, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were careful, but ye lacked opportunity. I'm sorry, but what, what Paul is talking about in this verse is that uh, they, the Philippians had, um, they had given him some, some money. To, I, I think that's what you're reading here, is that, um, that they had supported him financially. Um, and it, but then he goes on to say, not that I speak in respect for want. Okay, Paul says, listen, I didn't need it, you know. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And I think it's important that I have that, that word learned underlined. You know, because Paul, it, that's not something, contentment is not something that happens naturally. Right? Contentment is something that has to be learned. And, and Paul had to learn it. And I think we have to learn that too. Right? So he says, For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. So, and he's talking about when times are going bad, I have learned to be content. And when times are going good, I have learned to be content. And he says, uh, he continues, in everything, or oh, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed, again instructed, to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So, in the good days and in the bad, Paul had learned to have contentment or to be, um, to be at peace with it. And it was through the, through the Word. I mean, obviously, Paul had the Word working in him to get that contentment. And we can have that same contentment by allowing the Word to work in us. It, it's, a, it's being at peace with where you're at. Not only that, but to be happy with the things that you have. And, you know, sometimes that can be a hard thing. You know, I, that is something that I think we all have to learn is just to be happy, be happy with the things that we have. You know? And... And God gives us that instruction uh, to be, to be uh, at peace with that. Uh, if you'll turn back to um, 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'll continue down the verse. It says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world... And it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Um, you might notice that there are no U-Hauls behind hearses, right? We don't, get to, we don't get to bring anything back with We don't get to take anything with us when we leave. Um, and um, I think about, I'm going to have to leave my favorite fishing rod, right? Or how about that? How about that? Your your you know your awesome favorite surfboard, right? That 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 you uh, look forward to getting, or you know maybe it's a nice car. You know everything that we have in this world, your house, everything you have to leave it all behind. It makes you think. As temporary as we are, it makes you wonder why we devote so much time and attention to gaining things. You know, <laughs> and and the word of God makes this known. Um, two, there's another verse that I wanted to take you to in Psalms. Remember to keep your marker in 1 Timothy. But if you'll come to Psalms chapter 49, you know, you come and you start, you start finding these cool verses. You're like, man, that makes so much sense. You know, why haven't I seen that before? In Psalms chapter 49. Psalms chapter 49, and we'll start at verse 1. <clears throat> Psalms 49 and verse 1 starts out. He says, Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, 
and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline my ear to a parable and I will open my dark sayings upon the harp. That's just kind of all setting the stage. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and ceaseth not forever that he should live that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that the wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. And this is the verse 11 is kind of where it kind of brings it all together. He says, their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations, they call their lands after their own names. And, and we think about, you know, like when, when me and my wife, we were building, we, we bought some land and we built a house and we put up a, you know, we put up a barn and we're doing all these things. And we're thinking, man, you know, and then when, when we're gone, we can leave it to our kids, you know, leave it to our children and then, and then they can leave it to their children. And, but you know what? It doesn't work that way. Most of the time, you know, we think about, the, about keeping or, you know, building this, this estate, if you want to call it. And it says men have been doing this throughout all time. And they think to build up this estate. And the bottom line is, when you go, you have to leave it all behind. And you leave it to somebody else. Well, we're going to continue on in verse, fif verse 15. said, but God... But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me, Selah. And the, I mean, that's, that's our hope too, is that God is going to redeem us from the grave. He says, Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. He's talking about not just our, our physical possessions. You know, all our physical possessions. I mean, it's easy to understand that everything gets left behind when, when we pass, right? But he's talking about even their glory. Meaning, you know, me and Tammy were talking about this. Well, you know, what is it, what's a good, what's a good uh, analogy of this? And, you know, here on this world... It doesn't matter who you are. You could, be the, you could be George Clooney and your standing is going to be the same as Todd Furman before God, right? Or, or you know, you can think of any, any famous person is not going to have any more credit with God than, than us. And, and in Romans chapter 12, or Romans chapter 2, verse 11, you don't, I'll quote this one for you. Uh, Paul says, for there is no respect of persons with God. And, you know, there's some, there's some comfort in that, knowing that, uh, you know, so the glory that we have in this world, all of it gets left behind. And I'm not, say, I'm not saying anything to you guys that you don't already know, but it's just kind of neat when you can come to the Word and it kind of just lays it out there. You know, he says, man, all this stuff, you got to put it behind you. Because it ain't going to do you any good. The only thing that's going to do you any good in the life to come, like Paul says, is, is, the, is the Word of God and the godliness that it brings about. Um, come back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Come back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And... I'll read verse 7 again. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich, uh, but they that will be rich fall into temptation. Now, when he talks about they that will be rich, he's talking about they that, that's their goal in life, is to gain wealth. That's what they're trying to do. 
fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. And the Lord Jesus Christ has, he spoke a parable in, um, in uh, Luke chapter 12. If you'll go to Luke chapter 12, please. And we'll read this parable that the Lord uh, spoke to his disciples. And it comes along that line. Luke chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 13. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, okay, they're speaking to the Lord, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Isn't that funny? Lord, tell my brother to share, right? <laughs> my brother's not sharing. Would you tell him to share the inheritance with me? And Lord, uh, and he said unto him, Man, who hath made me judge or a divider over you? He's talking about his physical possessions. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Right? So that's, that's some pretty profound words right there. A man's life does, consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And then he speaks, and then he goes on to the parable. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room whereof to bestow my fruits. Now this is a picture of a guy that must have had some, he had some kind of a, um, a farm and he was, he was raising some kind of fruit or vegetables or something like that. And, and he had gained, he, had, he must have had a bumper crop that year, right? And he gained so much stuff that he didn't know what to do with it all. So then he continues in the verse and he says, and he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will bestow all my or I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. So he's going to build a big bigger barns than the ones that he has, right? So that he can contain all his wealth. In verse 19 he says, "And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry." I think I think we do that too, <laughs> he says. And I will say to my soul, soul, I have much goods. I think of somebody who has worked all his life to build up a retirement, you know, and, and we all think about this too, that, that, that um, he had laid up all these good for many years to take ease, to eat and drink and to be merry after he's worked so hard for many years. But in verse 20, but God saith unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then, who's, uh, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? And, and we've heard of that. Have you heard of those guys that have worked their whole life and then they get to a point where they retire and then within a year they're gone. They, they die, right? I mean, it's, we hear that happening all the time. And, uh, and so the Lord says, in verse 21, he says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So what we need to take from this is that we need to build that, you know, we need to be careful on what we are putting our focus on in our life. God does not say that we can't have wealth, but we want to make sure that we can, that we um, consider the things of God in our life and not let the wealth be the thing that controls us. You know? And, and, that's a, and that, that goes back to that meeting that I had with my friend. You know, the thing, we need to always be in mind of the things that God has provided for us. And as we go along, we don't want to let our physical possessions control us. You know, we, we want to make sure that we allow the things of God to have their 
their effect on us and to and to be the forefront and the center of our of our thinking Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 I'll just read it to you you don't have to go there Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 says for where your treasure is there your heart be also and I find that to be true you look at where your you know if you look at your bank account and see where your money's going that's what you're really working for you know whether it be a retirement or whether it be a nice house or whether it be a um, whether it be a nice car you know I know guys who spend more money on their on their boats than they do on their houses you know so you know that that's where their that's where their love is that their love lies and and what Paul is referring to us in first Timothy chapter 6 is to keep the things of God in mind you know we need to let the godly things have you know have control in our lives and not let the physical things control our lives let's go back to uh, let's go back to first Timothy chapter 6 again First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says for the love of money is the root of all evil for while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows and that's that's like that we read about that uh, that guy in the last parable he says you know that um, that the love of money is the root of all not to not to covet these things and to um, desire you know possessions but verse 11 he says but thou O man of God flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience and meekness those are the things that we should be devoting our time to following after Paul gives us that list and and he gives us an example Paul actually gives us an example if you go to Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 and we'll uh, look at uh, verse 4 Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4 you know we're, uh, since we're going through the book of Acts on Wednesdays we've been learning a lot of things about the Apostle Paul and and uh, you know the 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 you know setting up the churches and the struggles that he had gone through one thing that I realized that the Apostle Paul he, he walked everywhere you know he did a lot of walking and the other thing is you know you see him taking boats everywhere he was you know he probably has a, a lot of time out boating <laughs> you know and I wonder if when you know he must have had plenty of peaceful times when he's sitting there watching the sunset go down you know over the over the ocean you know but we want to look at a couple of things about the Apostle Paul here um, he he set the example in this here in verse 4 he's writing and he says though I might have confident though I might have confidence in the flesh if any man think thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh I more he's gonna lay out Paul's gonna lay out his credentials and what's happening is he says if you guys think that you or not you guys he's, he's talking to um, people that were coming after him and and uh, saying that they were you know thinking that they were something and he says if they might trust in the flesh I more and verse 5 circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless so he's laying out all these things about who he was before Acts chapter 9 and he had the life of luxury um, the the nearest that I could compare who he was in Acts chapter 9 is that he was probably he had a very high standing in the Jewish religion he being a Pharisee um, you know he um, he was probably like that of a you know like a, a Catholic priest today 
you know, where, where everybody was, you know, when they would walk in a room, they would, they would uh, you know, look up to them and, and think that they were special. And the thing is, the problem with Paul in that time is that um, it, it was a self-righteousness. It wasn't the true righteousness of God, but it was his self-righteousness that he had in that time. Um, So we know we see that he was um, that he he had probably had a life of of luxury. Um, in verse set, let's start and continue in verse seven. He says, "But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge." of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may that I may win Christ so Paul when he came to understand the truth about who the Lord Jesus Christ was immediately left all that notoriety and left all that luxury behind him and he, he does it for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And, that's, uh, and that is uh, something that we should be looking forward to too when we come to the Word is we're looking for the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and what, what He has done. But So if you think about the Apostle Paul, what do we see him in Acts chapter 18? He is a tent maker. So he went from being a Pharisee, being, you know, having a, a, you know, a, a pretty easy life to being a tent maker i don't know how rough it was to be a tent maker back in the uh, uh you know back in this time but uh, i'm sure it wasn't a very luxurious life you know but so paul had given up his his life in order to follow after christ and he continues in verse 9 he says and be and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which th is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So we're talking about following after righteousness. And the thing that we need to make sure is that the righteousness that we are following after or looking for is not our righteousness. It's not something that we can do in our flesh, but it's the righteousness that God Himself provides. And if if you'll come to, um, well, and you know, I'm just going to quote a verse for you again too. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse six says, "But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags." Do you remember, have you, have you remember that verse? Even the best person in the world that tries to do, you know, just, just gives his life to humanity, the best person, that righteousness before God is as filthy rags. Because God has provided a perfect righteousness. And that's the kind of righteousness that we need to follow after. The kind that God provides. And, and we can participate in that. And that's one of, the, one of the amazing things about what God has done for us in the age of grace is that He has made it to where we can be a part of what He is doing today. And in, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and um, Robert had used this verse this morning, and it's one of those, I think that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is one of those, it's one of those wow verses. Okay, and, and I, you, you've heard it over and over, but every time I come and hear this little verse, I think about it and go, wow, what God has done through the cross. You know, through, through what He has accomplished at the cross. In we're, we're going to read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And it says, For he, and that he is God the Father, for he hath made him 
That's the Lord Jesus Christ. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. The Lord Jesus Christ was sinless. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So what, does, what this little verse is saying is that God placed our sin on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we trust in what Christ has done for us, He then gives us His righteousness. I mean, that's, that is an amazing verse if you think about it. You know, that, that God gives us His righteousness. And that's the kind of righteousness that, that's the righteousness that we need to be following, you know, is, is His righteousness. He also says it in Romans chapter 3, verse 22. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, if you'll go there. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. And I'll start in 21 just to get the context. Paul writing here again, he says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets. Verse 22, Even the righteousness of God, which is by uh, faith of Jesus Christ, and look at this, unto all, so the righteousness of God is available unto everybody. He did it for everyone. Remember, he has, there is no, no special favor before God. It is unto everybody. And upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So what Paul is saying in this verse is that the righteousness of God is available to anybody who wants it, but it's only upon those who trust. So, I mean, the, the, the mechanics is this. We come to the Word of God and we see it and we hear it. And, it, and we, when we take... And, and the things that we read are about what Christ had done for us on the cross. And when we trust and believe that it is true, then God will give us His righteousness. And that's the kind of righteousness that we need to be chasing after and following after. Not the things of, you know, not the things of this. He, Paul makes that comparison. Don't be chasing the things of this world, but chase the things of God. And I think of that, the, uh, I, I think of, uh, you know, that righteousness that, that God has provided for us. And it's not ours. It's His righteousness that He, that he has provided and the other thing is the knowledge. Remember how Paul said that he gave everything up for the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have that also contained in, in the pages of this book. We can understand the things of God simply by opening it up and reading it. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm sorry, no, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul makes reference to this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Now what Paul is saying, Paul is actually praying for the Ephesian believers here, but it's the same prayer that, he, that we can pray too, is that we would gain an understanding of the wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of God. Now those are the things that we should be thinking about and, and putting our focus on. Um, the knowledge that we chase after is not a worldly knowledge, but is, it is a godly knowledge. And 
I would, these are some things that we, that God has given us to chase after. And I would, I would say not to, don't be like, you know, my friend Robert, who waited until it was too late, right? To know and understand the things of God. And, you know, I mean, I, it, it, it just, it, it affected me to, to think that, uh, you know, you're laying there getting ready to go before the Lord and you think about your life and all you ever did is think about yourself. You know? And, and to, to now, we have the opportunity to make God's Word known. And, and we'll close off in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. First Corinthians fifteen verse fifty eight. <clears throat> and I'm gonna uh, again, again I'm gonna kick back and go to fifty seven. It says, But thanks be to God which giveth giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for ye, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The works of this world are vain. Everything that we try to work for and gain, whether it would be, you know, riches or, uh, you know, making, a, uh, and, you know, trying to build a large estate or a long retirement, all these things are vain. They're empty. But he says that your labor in the Lord is not vain. And rem I remember that verse where, where in Paul, in, uh, in 1 Timothy 4, where he says, he says, it is profitable, for godliness is profitable, not only in, I'm going to have to go to it. I'm going to have to go to it because I'm not going to be able to quote it. For... Uh, for, God, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So I would encourage you to focus on the things of the Lord. And, and, and like when I'm saying this, I'm talking to myself. Focus not so much on the things of this world, but focus on the things of the Lord. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words on the page and we thank you for the opportunity to put our focus on the things of your word and the things that you have provided for us. Lord, we thank you for the age of grace and for all that you have made available to us and for the Lord Jesus Christ, and for all He has done for us. It's in His name that we pray. Amen.